Easter, I felt married all over the country. Que italiano e mora aqui em Lisboa, já há alguns anos. Eu vi lá o grupo que me passou a escrever com a HIV, uh, artistas. Tivemos a ideia de que seria muito importante aqui em Portugal. Há imagem de outros países como o Brasil, como os Estados Unidos, outros países pelo mundo em que já existe um ativismo ligado com as artes. Então seria muito importante de criarmos este movimento aqui. Um, isto surgiu numa residência artística que tivemos em setembro. O coletivo viral pretende ser um lugar não só para pessoas que vivem com HIV, mas para pessoas que se interessam pela causa. Nós pensamos o HIV-Sida como um campo de pesquisa em artes e, ao mesmo tempo, como um campo de pesquisa na sociedade para falar sobre aspectos ligados à condição humana. Não é? Toda a gente, pelo menos alguma vez na vida, já passou por opressão. Toda a gente já passou alguma vez na vida por rejeição, seja numa entrevista de trabalho, seja num date. Então nós queremos ir a esses princípios que estão por trás de quem convive com esta condição de saúde, mas que no fundo são extensivos a várias pessoas, não é? que não necessariamente têm que conviver com o vírus. E isso acaba por ser algo que nos move dentro do coletivo, encontrar essas metáforas, esses princípios que depois são trazidos para o corpo, que depois são trazidos para ações performáticas. É um coletivo mutante e que está uh, aberto a receber também pessoas que se interessem por esta temática. A ideia de criarmos esta ação veio de uma necessidade de visibilizar e, e pela primeira vez, talvez, contar com um grupo e com uma comunidade que protagoniza vivências com VIH para que elas não sejam contadas em terceira pessoa. Desde os anos 80 até hoje, tem havido muita narrativa sobre VIH, mas, uh, especialmente nos últimos anos, tem-se perdido muito a narrativa das próprias pessoas que vivem com VIH, porque, desde que viver com VIH tem deixado de ser uma sentença de morte, também se tem deixado muito de falar do assunto e a própria cinematografia, a literatura e comunicação social se tem afastado um pouco do tema porque a falta da urgência e da morte tem tirado alguma atrativa. Quem vive com VIH? Ok, so I will invite you to uh, watch this. this. This is on our social media. I will leave that in the end. It's a 10 minute uh, documentary. <laughs> so I will go on talking a little bit, contextualizing a little bit my action in the activism. Uh, other side of it, it's my current work as an artist and an educator. And currently I'm developing two projects at the same time, one performance and a community project. I will talk a little bit about that. And both, what unifies both is I'm researching the virus as an en engine, as a trampoline for social change, individual and collective change. Uh, and I, I feel that um, in Portugal, there was nobody occupying my place. There, there is no woman visible, artist woman living with HIV and bringing that to uh, the, my, the research, to the um, elaborating speech about that. So I feel that I'm here to, to tell a new story about HIV and having, this, uh, having the arts as a starting point and let's do it. <laughs> okay, I feel that is also important as I'm talking about a 10 years journey uh, to contextualize how I am I understanding the virus right now. How do I understand a virus with whom I'm coexisting for 10 years? Uh, I feel that uh, I was uh, of a generation of a change of paradigm. So I found out about my diagnosis in 2011. And in 2016, um, the medicine, th there was um, a big breakthrough. So the medicine, the, the uh, doctors start to say that right now we live in this new area uh, called indetectable equal to intransmissible. If some of you don't know what this means, I, I invite you to research. 
and this uh, transform HIV in a chronic disease for whom has access and is consistent in medication. So today, what I feel is that uh, nowadays HIV for me it's not anymore in a privileged country like Portugal that we have uh, access to the medicine for free. Uh, it's not anymore a medical disease, but it's a social disease. So we still face a lot of prejudice, and that's why it's so important to be developing this kind of event here. So I understand this kind of event is amazing and very innovative, in, uh, even, even if it was happening in New York, okay? But this happening here, and bringing people from the place to speak in direct speech, I think it's such important to broaden the, the uh, speech about this. So thank you a lot, yeah. And what I mean when I say that HIV is a social disease is that it's still the silence, the oppression, the rejection, the prejudice is, it, it's what keeps people in depression, in struggling, and eventually uh, kills. And so the antidote is information, the antidote is a proximity, dialogue, because if you know someone with HIV, you humanize, you, you have the chance to, 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 to see through times how this person lives, the vitality, the, the struggles, so this is really important. That's why we need more people visible. Um, and for me, uh, this 10 years journey, uh, it, it's been a roller coaster. Sometimes it still is. And it's changed, it, it's, it brought me diff new identities, uh, brought me a new body, new social identity. Uh, it changed my affections, it changed, um, it forced me to make new connections, making sense of the world in a new way. I will talk a little bit more about that. And uh, creating a dialogue with the, the, um, the content of this event, I feel more and more th uh, the need to bring out our vulnerability and see it as a, a, a strength, as a force. Um, and also I feel that HIV brought me a language. So if we, some of us, we speak one, two, three, for example, I speak four languages, and each one of, the, uh, of them uh, allow me to express a different side of my personality or to see the world in a different way. So HIV, I see it as also as a language right now in my life, um, especially a language that uh, broadened a lot my empathic capacity, and it's still a difference. I'm, I still feel I'm privileged because it's an invisible difference. So it's a difference that I can choose when to put it out. Uh, but it, it allowed me a lot to connect with other experience of marginalization and oppression. So I'll talk a little bit about UNA, this transdisciplinary performance that I'm premiering in some days in Cap Verde, in Festival Mindelact. Um, it's a research that um, it talks about this 10 year journey as a woman living with HIV. And it's also very important in this research to bring other voices. So it brings a multivocal perspective. I've been doing interviews with people living with HIV for six years. That's how I met Paolo. <laughs> I, I asked, can I do an interview with you? And these interviews, they come in the performance as uh, when you're trying to connect the radio and you feel there is a lot of uh, different layers. So I, I relate and I enter in dialogue with these different voices. And not only bringing this direct speech, but also uh, bringing the perspective of the other. How it is to receive this new? Okay, so I develop uh, research on Tinder. <laughs> And I also bring that in the performance. Uh, this is kind of a spoiler. <laughs> and I invite you to come and see. Um, this is an international premiere, but we'll have dates. I will leave all the information in the end. Um, this UNA, I'm very, I'm very happy because it was the first time I came public and I did, uh, I started to, to search for fundings. 
uh, to develop and to build this performance. We are a team right now of 10. And I, I was very happy to be awarded by Gulbenkian Foundation, which is the highest, uh, one of the highest uh, foundation here. GDA and Campus, which is a, a new performative arts in Porto. Um, and in this performance, uh, I, uh, I've been researching through the pro creative process, which is a way to create sense and the arts as a way to create meaning in the world. Uh, there are different exceptions of virus that are coming. So I will not give of a spoiler, and I have my time here, but I can mention just like the virus in the medical sense, the virus in, in the social dimension, the relationships, the, the virus appearing in the relationship, and also the virus as the crash in the system. You know, when, oh, my computer is with virus. And so I bring different exceptions of virus uh, in different ways through dance, through uh, physical theater, through work with props and, and voices, and yeah. And also, UNA is part of a larger project called IMUN. It's a project that intends to discuss what do we understand as immunity right now in the world. And also, it's a project that intends to remember us that we, uh, we cannot forget um, the community as immunity, as Paul Preciado uh, brings us. Uh, so it's a project, it's an itinerant project that will, will be developed first here in Portugal, and then Europe, and then who knows the world? <laughs> Dream big, right? And it, it, it brings workshops, lectures in schools, uh, urban interventions, and the performance UNA. And uh, what is behind uh, of this uh, communitary project is the idea of the art as a mean to develop citizenship, and a kind of citizenship more adapted to the 21st century, so one that includes the body, affections, and sexuality. And I'm going to show a little bit of, I, I, I'll show, I'll not show the dance, but I'll show the video, the scene, the video from the performance, one of them. Okay, uh, so I'll be dancing at the same time, and this is one of the first scenes of uh, Una. I'll go on now talking a little bit of uh, a perspective which is very keen for me, which is this of a wisdom that the positive bodies carried for being facing and coexisting with virus, some of us for 10 years, some of us for 30 years. So. I just want to mention that uh, I was in San Francisco when the pandemic hit, and immediately, like one month after, 
they were calling and organizing lectures, online lectures, with people living with HIV and just saying, like, we want to hear you. <laughs> so that these bodies are uh, having to develop resilient answers to face uncertainty, as we all did all throughout this last uh, one year and a half. Uh, so I, I feel that what we are uh, claiming right now is not, not only the need for visibility and to end the prejudice, but also to see the, the potent discourse, uh, speeches that come from this wisdom of coexisting with virus. Um, and I feel that, okay, science can take part, can address some part of the cure, and art can address another part of the cure. And I feel that we still are claiming for physical cure. We are. We cannot lose this out of sight as activists from behind, they, they uh, did that today we have the medicines. We also need to keep pushing for the physical cure. And at the same time, quality of life and, and using each one our means to, to, to bring this to more visibility. And just to, to end my, my presentation here, I feel I see each day more uh, the HIV as a crossroad cr cause. Uh, the um, potential of intersectionality of HIV, that it's a contrahegemonical cause that doesn't have a, a profile associated. It doesn't come with a gender, with skin color, with class. So I feel this is a great potential for us to open space for other contrahegemonical causes. Um, and especially the, the theme that brings us together today. Also, I feel that having revealed my status uh, made me connect to my peers. And also, like when I met Paolo, um, we were also, we all were both feeling like we were kind of in individual struggles. And the, the sense of connecting, we connected first, and then this event, viral, uh, the first event of viral, became a transnational action in kind of one month and a half. Uh, and then participated in UK, and we're just uh, knowing about this today. So this is amazing. And this is what we need, too. The, uh, I feel this is also connecting me with Brazil uh, again, right now. And I'm working a lot with Brazil. Um, and yeah, it's what you said, like it's a different kind of uh, community yeah, are engaged for something that it's not uh, money or it's a thing, it's a virus. So what could come out of this? And my, my message in, in the end is just, we need more visible people. So if you know, or if you are here listening to us, if you are able, come with us. <laughs> and, and we need more allyship. And I leave you with this suggestion for allyship, for non-positive bodies, ways that you can be an ally. One of uh, mo most important for me is to awaken the sense of co-responsibility. And HIV is not a question of people living with HIV. HIV is a question of all, as COVID is. And yeah, so this has to do with uh, the necessity of each one assuming this responsibility. And I'll end with the social media. In my link tree, you will find uh, all the information about the actions I developed. I will have a campaign to fund the um, immune. I'm searching for funding for this. So if you want to give your contribution, you're most welcome. And yes, yeah, so follow us in social media. And thank you so much. I give the word to you. Uh, is that working? Yeah. Um, 
First of all, um, I just want to say thank you, Teresa and Paola, and everyone from um, the Viral Collective. It's so lovely to meet you. On that day of action, uh, we were in London, and it was pissing it down. It was raining all day, and we were like hiding behind the lions in Trafalgar Square. And then when I see that, I'm like, yours is so much more sexy and dramatic than ours was. <laughs> Um, so yeah. it's so lovely to meet you in person and also what you're doing is so profound and, and world changing and revolutionary like the first public correct me if I'm wrong the first public HIV visible action in Portugal yeah so can we have a round Having of applause for that yeah that's incredible um, and let's just um, for one or two minutes Find someone next to you that you don't know, um, that you've never really met before, and just have a chat about insights and reflections from the incredible activism that we've just heard about. So find someone new, just for one or two minutes, any insights or reflections or questions from the presentation. I love go. this go. Go. Yeah. It's counting the time. Find someone new. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Portuguese, uh, Portuguese, English? Uh, no, in Italian. In Italian. Italian. Okay. okay. So. So. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for and your reflection. See. It was very, very, I mean, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm totally impressed with yeah. what you're doing. And I'm, I really think that this is something that we should, I mean, follow more and more. And I, I'm, uh, and, and, and uh, it's a, it's a strength that you are like uh, founding together with the community, and it's very very needed. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. You live here in Lisbon. No. Mm. Oh, amazing, amazing. Yeah. So you see how in a, a paradigm change we are in, in Portugal uh -huh. right now. Yeah. Because there is this work yeah. is not done. So, we yeah. need to keep opening the path. Yeah, and I think... Oh. They... Yeah, I, was, I still don't have... Is a, it on? A national what did I learn? I'm, I'm just... Um, I'm just really emotional to me. I will post everything. So just because, uh, right now we're having the problem of the so uh, booking again, so po postpone performance of the pandemic. So people are saying, like, okay, let's talk in 2022 or 2023. So I just have one date, but it's in the, in the interior of Portugal, in Guarda. Yes. But uh, if you, yeah, please follow us, uh, una imun, una dot imun, and you will know about all of And I gave a speech for the national TV last, uh, this couple of days ago. So I, I tell a little bit more, I show a little bit of the rehearsals. And, and you have like some um, sort of net, international network, you don't have some? No, we don't, but we are trying to have. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk more. In the, yeah, thank you so much. No. I should get back. I need to check. I love, I love the score. Is it I love the score. Uh, 30 seconds left? Ah, oh, you've got that picture, great. You can get... Oh, okay, good. Mm. Where's the... Um, yeah, next now you have... Exactly. Next. Next, it's just go. doing it. Right. <laughs> um, okay, good people. Um, that was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot. Shh. Come back, everyone. We'll, uh, we've got lunch next. We've got lunch next, so we can catch up then. <laughs> Let's yeah. just have um, three insights in... Short, as short and snappy as you can. Three insights from um, viral, from the from Teresa's presentation. Go. No time for shyness. Mm. Oh. Oh, okay. It was just insights and reflections from your activism, basically. Yes. Um, yeah, no worries. You want to say? Sing. Hey. Reflections from reflections from the activism that we heard about. Reflections from Shared. yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I'm not going to say anything new, but I was I was sharing with Joan that uh, 
I had heard of, of this concept that you, of before that you mentioned, um, it, given that nowadays in privileged countries like such as Portugal, as you said, where we can access for free medication for HIV positive people, um, and they can like the, the, for example, the life expectancy is, is almost as high as a person who is HIV negative and, and you, you even like access this state where that you mentioned the area of undetectable equals intransmiss intransmissible. And then it becomes quite clear that what you said, that what's left is the social aspect of the disease. So it's basically a social disease in the sense that people are um, still, despite all the medical progress, they are still facing um, social stigma and social prejudice. And I was sharing with Jerome that I know of some stories of people who have been diagnosed in recent years and people who are quite young, like 20, uh, 25, and who have um, stayed in the closet about their diagnosis for one year, not telling one single person that they were HIV positive and just managing, obviously, very poorly the um, emotional turmoil that it uh, arose. So it's mm. like it just shows how much of a social disease yeah. it, it is. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. If I can share something, I, I should keep the word the mask on, right? Yeah. Yeah, because of the microphone, all right. Um, I think, yeah, of course, uh, there's still, you know, a lot of stigma around HIV and AIDS, and so people who get diagnosed even recently, in some cases, especially if they do not belong to communities who are particularly informed, because like within the LGBT community, due to the implementation of PrEP, which is a, a prophylaxis, you know, a prevention strategy, a lot of people have become, in recent years, a little bit more aware about what HIV is because by having to prevent it with this strategy, they see a doctor more often or they have consultations more often or they're tested for other STIs more often. And it ends up um, soothening a little bit the stigma and discrimination towards people who are already living with HIV because, of course, when people get to know a lot more about the virus itself and how it reproduces into the body or it is untransmittable if controlled, of course, that fear comes off. And uh, I also have a reflection that is about the activism we have been doing since U equals U um, came out. Mm -hmm. So U equals U means that if you have an undetectable viral load, meaning that your treatment for HIV is effective, you cannot transmit it anyway. I mean, condomless sex is not a risk, so you can finally have your, uh, live, live your fantasy of a sexual life that is free of stigma, etc. Anyway, we have to also take into consideration that not all the people who live with HIV are undetectable because not all the people who live with HIV in the world receive the treatment. So her remark yes. on being in a privileged position was very useful. And so when we move forward with this activism towards eradicating stigma against HIV and people who live with HIV, we also need to take into consideration that even before we knew that we are untransmittable, we still had the right to not be discriminated against. And if we have no access to the medication of no awareness of our status, and we are living with HIV, there are still condoms. Uh, and people do not need to discriminate against us just because their fear is based on you know, the risk of infection. Risk of infection has always been there until we knew it wasn't. And we still had many more um, you know, instruments and tools to fight discrimination towards people living with HIV in a more intersectional uh, way that also includes those who do not have the access to the medication. So I think this is a very important political yes. point that we as artists, uh, community activists, educators, or simply people living with HIV have to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Yeah. Hello. Uh, and one more from that side. Uh, one more reflection from that side. Anyone? Keep it, keep it quick. I mean, to, re yeah. to report what we were uh, saying, actually, we started immediately talking about a um, relationship with uh, the heroin use, for example, in the 80s. So also how a kind of um, the 
HIV and AIDS epidemic in, in the 80s was also related to a social and cultural um, kind of, uh, yeah, plan, let's say, to control the population. So heroin was um, kind of um, emitted in, in the social environment, especially of like left-wing political groups from the end of the 70s to break down the uh, allyship and uh, the solidarity and uh, the political revolutionary view that were like connected to that. And we were talking with them the other day also how that, uh, for example, in countries like, I'm Italian, so in countries like Italy, instead of uh, the arrival of HIV and AIDS, uh, instead of creating a community around the, the, the necessity to respond to a social crisis, to demand uh, from the government certain things, actually bro broke down a lot of the allyship that were uh, created politically in the 70s. So it's a totally different, totally different experience from um, what happened in, uh, in the States or in the UK, for example. Uh, and yeah, but we started talking about uh, heroin and also when was the last time that either Portugal or Italy had a, a, a prevention campaign, mm. uh, state-founded or at least like a public campaign that was addressing the... <laughs> Um, not even prep, but <laughs> the HIV, um, and and we both. I mean, was either end of the nineties in Portugal and two thousand and three, I think, in Italy, and then after that, it was just um, silence. So it's also interesting how this thing kind of oh, it's not an emergency anymore, right? Like there's always this um, feeling that we. Um, contained a, a, an emergency within a society. And it's mm -hmm. interesting now also to see a different pandemic with a different <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, social background, a different way to that the virus interact with the body. So the, the way the, uh, the stigma, I, I think it was like, at least my idea was that the stigma uh, comes from a certain pretend an in intentionality. So it, it's not, the virus is not inten has no intention, it just spread, right? But in case of HIV, all in a sudden it was like, oh, you caught it because there was an intention behind it or there was a, um, a risky behavior mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Corona is, at the beginning was completely different and now also it's turning into a, a similar thing. So it's a lot of personal responsibility for, for yeah. this thing. And also, again, heroin was in the, in the picture similar all of these things. We're like, oh, you are a junkie, so therefore. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, remind me how long I've got until, I've got 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay, good. Um, yeah, I'm only gonna use one picture today because fuck screens. I've been too much on screens like I'm sure everyone has the last <laughs> year and a half. So all I'm gonna give you is a big pile of shit which we dropped outside of a far right politician's office on World AIDS Day in 2014, um, which made me really happy because we got half a ton of shit from a local farm in London. Um, Nigel Farage, do people know Nigel Farage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at the time, one of the awful HIV xenophobic bigoted things he was saying was that the, um, the, the last kind of migrants we need in the UK are those living with HIV. Um, so me and my friend, and along with ACT UP London, we were discussing what we should do. Um, so we got half a ton of horse shit, found um, Nigel Farage's office um, and in South London, and took the shit to it. And it says, what goes around comes around. Solidarity on World AIDS Day, UKIP stinks, ACT UP London, obviously with the World AIDS Day um, red ribbon. And they ended up, Nigel Farage and UKIP ended up getting kicked out of their South London office because the landlord was like, I can't be dealing with activists dropping shit on my, <laughs> on my garage, um, which is more than we could have ever asked for. And that led on to other actions, which I'll talk about. But first of all, I just wanted to say so much thank you to Barbara, Inesh, Ivan, Andrea, four vulnerable beings. And it's Obviously, like you say, Teresa, to have it in this context, to be together in the flesh, but also it's really given me the opportunity to think about the connections of vulnerability and my own body, because we're so busy organizing actions all the time, we don't really get the time to be like, wow, yeah. how can our bodies be 
the vulnerability of our bodies be a tool for revolutionary social change. It makes, do we all know Brené Brown? Um, the TED Talks, the power of vulnerability, I feel a bit like a budget, Brené Brown. Um, because it's true what she says in terms of the vulnerability of our, of our bodies. Um, and so I just wanted to tell a few stories from my own personal diagnosis to ACT UP London, to, well, when we reformed ACT UP London, it was obviously around in the 80s and 90s, um, and to some of the change-making things and the community that comes about. Um, like you were saying, Teresa, it makes me think of your book, um, your book, Tamaza, and, and um, the explosion, the explosion that happens when you connect with, yeah. with your HIV, the explosion both in your heart for the grief of what's happened before to people who were murdered by many of our governments during the 80s and 90s. Um, to, but on the, on the other side, the beautiful connections and the friendships for life and the, your community, your family. So many of us are not connected to our biological roots because of familial homophobia, HIV phobia, that you create the most beautiful new family. Um, and so in a little potted history, I come from a very religious, orthodox Jewish family in London, where being gay is an abomination, don't even mention HIV. Um, I was a kid during the time of Section 28, which was Thatcher's um, banning of the promotion of homosexuality in public institutions at the very time of the HIV and AIDS epidemic when we should have been talking and acting on it left, right and center. Obviously, she was in cahoots with Reagan. Um, so I didn't know fuck all about HIV when I was diagnosed, just when I was barely an adult. Um, I remember going to the doctor after having um, the seroconversion, which is a very heavy, like flu-like symptom. Um, and he was chatting to me in a language, and I love what you were saying about HIV language as well. At this time, it was alienating. He was talking to me about CD4 and viral loads and seroconversion. I'm just thinking, listen, can I still give blowjobs, mate? Like, <laughs> what's going on? Like, tell me about my sex life. I don't understand. I don't want to think about the intensity of what's going to happen to my, to my body and put it off thinking about it. Luckily, I didn't have to take medication for five years. Um, then I had, and I didn't, still know, I didn't know anything about HIV activism. I put it into a little box in my head until I had to take the medication. Um, and then I had this lover at the time who I was really nervous about, hence the, the kind of key first, second key point about vulnerable bodies and beings, really nervous about telling him, about disclosing my HIV status, because mm -hmm. I'm sure as a lot of positive people in the room, you dream about it, you have nightmares about it, you think about it 24 seven, before you become empowered by it and make these connections. Um, and I remember going round to his and being like, oh, Terry, there's something I've got to tell you. I don't really know how to tell you. Uh, I can leave if you want. He was like, what's going on? Spit it out. And I was like, oh, I can, I can order a taxi if you want. He was like, fucking spit it out. What have you got to tell me? And I was like, oh, I'm HIV positive. I'm really sorry. I can leave now. And he was like, don't be so fucking patronizing. As a, as a gay man, as a human being on the planet, it's not up to you to educate me about HIV. It's about, about up to me to educate myself about it. Um, now get in my bed. And then the next morning we watched ACT UP films. I'd never heard about ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. It was like, watch United in Anger. If anyone hasn't already got their mitts on this, and obviously it's amazing Sarah Shulman's coming for the second part. Um, like, put away your social life for a bit because it's 700 pages. Um, and that's how I found out about ACT UP and that it wasn't my issue to deal with, it's societies. Um, and I never, never looked back. How long do I have? <laughs> okay, I don't want to eat into people's lunch. Um, fast forward a few years after um, a coming out show uh, um, on the 25th anniversary of ACT UP, ACT UP New York, Activist Peter Staley came to London. We used that opportunity to restart ACT UP. And one thing that I really, really relate to, one of the many things I really relate to what you were saying is the job is not done. People often get sentimental. Um, the HIV was something of the 80s and 90s, but the mission originally was and still is healthcare for all, simple. Yeah. We are so far away from that. We've still got a job to do. We still know what our individual and collective purpose on the planet is. And at the time in 2014, we were living in a, what was called the second silence in Britain um, for three compounding reasons. Um, 
the rise in HIV diagnosis. So this is why it's not something to get sentimental about. Um, the rise in um, diagnosis, particularly amongst communities already threatened by the, what's called a hostile environment. In Britain, our Tory, disgusting government, have an explicit strategy called the hostile environment, to be literally hostile to migrants, um, hence the horseshit. Um, and so one of, one of the communities where there's the fastest growing um, rise of diagnosis is the migrant community, because people are scared to go to the doctors in case they're going to get illegally deported, put in detention centers. So that's the number one reason of what we call the second silence. The number two reason being the cuts in services because of austerity and turbo capitalism and gentrification. And that's not just the clinics, that's HIV education prevention support services, the mental health support services, the women's support services, the gender-based violence support services, all have been shut, resulting in higher rates of anxiety, depression, suicide. I'll stop on the depressing part in a second. Um, and the third compounding reason being the general belief that it was something resolved in the 80s and 90s, which is not for those first two reasons. So that's why we call it the second silence. That's why we started, restarted ACT UP London. Um, and I'm just going to give a few of the actions, um, the exciting actions which came after the horseshit. Um, all of these, if you haven't, where well, you're going to see United in Anger in the second part, I've probably seen it about 200 times and I never get bored and I can actually say it word for word, all of the ACT UP New, York's New York activist lines, but I won't give the game away. But some of that actions when it comes to collective, creative, joyful, daring, brave solidarity, putting a giant condom over Jesse Helms's house. Um, do you know what I mean? They've got a house-sized condom um, over a notorious, homophobic, bigoted arsehole's um, house when he was out. Um, so they're putting a condom over a house. Um, the legendary action in New York Grand Central Station when they attached helium balloons um, to a giant banner which said, fight AIDS, not war. And there was thousands of people who took over Grand Central Station. But the one which always, always gives me the shivers is the ashes action in 1992. Um, when people took the ashes of their loved ones um, oh. in protest to the White House gates and chucked the ashes over of their, of their loved ones who've been murdered by the government. And to be able, one of the other amazing books, aside from these two, is Act Up Emotions by Deborah Gould, which one of the explicit strategies of Act Up was to put the emotions of the message at the forefront. And that was using, utilizing grief as a tool for rage and solidarity and power, but just yeah. Just to throw the ashes of your dad or your girlfriend or whoever, your child, over the White House gates. Oh, my God. So in the spirit of that and learning from the older generation of ACT UP, we did this. And then Nigel Farage was still being a prick. Um, and at the time, he was saying lots of bigoted things. Um, and so we decided to create a cabaret which was going to invade his local pub. Because what he said was like, I'm a man of the people. You can come and chat to me in my pub. It was like, all right, then we will. Um, so at the time, he said, um, breastfeeding mothers should face the wall. Um, he was on a train from Manchester to London, and he didn't like the sound of hearing all these international languages. Um, he was late for a meeting in Wales, and he blamed the traffic on the motorway on migrants. Um, another UKIP counsellor, um, when gay marriage was introduced in 2014, it was bad weather, and he said it was a sign from God, um, as well as the bigoted comments about HIV migrants. So we got together, and this is one of the many strategies of ACT UP, is all injustices are connected, seeing our yeah. struggles as, as part of the bigger picture, because um, there's no fucking time to waste. And back then, people were dying, people are still dying, we need to get together, hence why this is so important. Um, so we just decided to create a cabaret, and everyone did a parody of the bigoted statements that he was saying. So we found out his, where his pub was in Kent, near London. Um, so we had breastfeeding mothers at the bar with their boobs out. Uh, we had a, a migrant traffic jam blockading the round of the pub. Um, we had Luca doing the HIV um, activism, anti-stigma classes um, in the pub. 
Um, we had different language tables. We had Chinese, Arabic, uh, Polish language classes on the tables. Because obviously what you said, I don't like hearing all these different languages. Uh, we had my friend Ruth, who's a Holocaust survivor, who opened up um, the cabaret, looking at the parallels of what she went through, because this was on the 70th anniversary of the official end of the Nazi Holocaust. Um, and we had Palestinian dancers, we had so much more, and then we found out that Nigel was across the road. Um, and so we took all, all of our activists together in a conga line, singing We Are Family to him, um, and that's it, he asked for it. He said, come and meet me in my pub, and that's what we did. Um, and then he left, and then we carried on having a great time. And actually, that action was so um, powerful for each of our different communities to learn about each other's issues. Um, then the last few actions I want to mention, PrEP. I don't know the situation in, in Portugal about PrEP, and I'd love to hear more. This was uh, really like 2016 and 17. Um, PrEP wasn't available for everyone um, on the NHS in, in England. We went into NHS England's offices and did a noise demo with, with all the cutlery and all the saucepans that we could. Um, we found Gilead's office in central London. Gilead, one of the key pharmaceutical companies who were responsible for not lowering the price of drugs. Um, and five of, our, five of our activists got naked and went in the giant windows with G-R-E-E-D on their butts, uh, which was a great photo shoot. Um, again, a very exa good example of vulnerable bodies, vulnerable beings yeah. in, in an action. Um, we did a queue around the um, main kind of STD sexual health clinic in central London, um, the queue to nowhere because we couldn't get access to medication. Um, and everyone was dressed up in blue because of PrEP. Then two of the last actions, um, ACT UP Women um, started uh, the Catwalk for Power, Resistance and Hope, um, where because of the multifaceted, multifaceted oppressions and patriarchal context that we're living in, it's super difficult, especially obviously for migrant women to expose their status. Um, they initially were going to do a catwalk where they had masks on, as part of a fashion show in various different central London locations. But before the first fashion show, they were like, fuck it. We love who we are. We're proud of who we are. This is obviously led by Sylvia. Um, and that catwalk for power, resistance, and hope is still going on. And the last one, which actually makes me think of what you said at the beginning, our, our blind date. Every um, World Days Day up until the pandemic, we had a show called HIV Blind Date. Has anyone seen the British cheesy TV show called Blind Date with Silla no. Black? It's quite simple format. It's you have um, three contestants who want to date the person behind the screen and they want to, they ask the questions and they've got to respond. So we created a show in the spirit of that um, because everyone living with HIV deserves love um, and fun and romance just as much as everyone else, maybe even more. Um, with HIV-related questions, um, with all the different members of our community touching on the different issues, but obviously having a, like a witty spin on them all. And so that's our show every World Days Day called HIV Blind Day. Um, but we're not doing that this year because Sarah's coming to London just before she comes back to Lisbon um, to talk about Let the Record Show um, and to be able to um, connect with what you're doing in Portugal and to connect with the ACT UP New York activists um, is such an honor because really we're living in extraordinary times when it comes to the opportunity to have these conversations yeah. Yeah. Um, is, is so powerful. Um, I don't know what else, oh, oh yeah, one other thing, last thing that I was gonna say, um, oh fuck it, two last things I was gonna say. The epigenetics of vulnerability mm. is something I think a, a lot about. Mm. Going back to where I started with the Jewish aspect of things. Um, my grandparents were all Nazi Holocaust survivors, two from Germany, two from Poland. And one thing of the many things I learned from them um, is you have to let trauma out. You have to let trauma out. The whole better out than in kind of philosophy. And that's really what I took with me, learning from, because otherwise HIV will be a war on our own immune, immune system. We have to get it out to collectivize it. And so that's one thing I really took about trauma, the, the epigenetics of trauma in, in our system. And the last thing I wanted to say is, um, 
the, the prep and how incredible and miraculous it is. Um, I wasn't going to put a picture of, of my baby because that would be weird. Um, but me and another ACT UP activist, um, we were always kind of joking. Um, this was like 12 years ago that we'd have a kid. And then she was like, right, I'm getting serious. And um, she lives in like an ACT UP women's commune up in Scotland. And I'm obviously based in London. Um, she didn't even need, to, I had a wank in a jar in my kitchen. Um, it worked. She didn't even need to take prep, um, which for me is a mind blower. I thought at the time it was still sperm washing, um, which we were going to make a show about. Um, uh, but that's ghetto now. That's not even relevant anymore. It's just amazing because of activism, which then obviously the pharmaceutical companies take credit for. It's like you didn't fight for prep. Um, the, we can have, we can reproduce. I never thought I'd have kids, biological kids. Um, but, and that's because of prep. So there's our little act up baby, which if you come to the UK, hopefully you'll meet. Uh, I've rattled on enough. Thank you so much for having us. Um, Even though we are a little bit behind schedule, I don't want to miss the opportunity of uh, having precisely uh, Dan and Teresa here and also like to open the floor to you to, to make some, some questions. And precisely, I, I would like to, to, to start with one question that is, uh, I think that it was really moving the way that you were uh, both, uh, in a way, um, not only talking but performing activism and in a very specific uh, way. And I think uh, that it was a way that it was very joyful. And it's something that we don't have to forget. Uh, uh, very often, uh, some of the rhetorics or even some of the narratives related to um, activism, and especially, for example, with uh, HIV AIDS, are very much based on this kind of gloomy uh, images that, of course, were extremely important, especially at the very beginning. But I remember of the HIV AIDS uh, crisis uh, at the beginning of the 80s, and I remember that uh, when I was uh, in New York, when I was interviewing uh, some of the members of ACT UP or even the gay men's health crisis, at the very beginning, they were like, yeah, of course, we were very much aware that we were dying, that there was a lack of information, that we didn't have any kind of representation, not only in the government, but also in the media and in society at large. But also, when we were in the hospital, when we were even like waiting for our results, uh, we were also cruising, and we were also flirting, and we were also uh, you know, sharing some jokes because that was also very much political. That was very much uh, our definition of activism. And it has to be preserved in a way because it was also against this idea that the activist is always, you know, this kind of cis head, uh, white middle class man in the street fighting with a brick, and, you know, like against the police. And it was like, yeah, that was very much valid. But it was also about partying, it was also about kissing, it was also about caring for each other, it was also about other bodies and other definitions of bodies, and about even touching each other. Mm -hmm. It was very much uh, political. So, precisely about that, I wanted to ask you about this sense of joy, uh, joyful or uh, this kind of festivity that uh, really we can uh, feel, that we can breathe from your perspective and what do you think about it uh, in, your, in your own work? Uh, it, it is the essence really for me. Um, I guess it's, it's the, um, the two dramatic faces of, of a comedy and tragedy. Because when you've been at death's door, when you face, where else are you going to go? You've got, you've got, um, you go to the other end of the spectrum of like finding the joy in things. Um, there's, uh, yeah, and you said it com completely how it was in terms of the joy, the the seduction, the eros. Because as one word I really was reading a chapter this morning is the deep passion that people had 
because literally they went to the next meetings every Monday night in the ACT UP New York Centre and their best mates might not be there the next week because they would be dead. It was life and death and there was a deep passion which is joy, which is yeah. life. And just one last, God, I always go back to the Jewish thing. Um, I've got this, this quote on my arm which relates to that by um, a Dutch mystical activist um, called Etty Hillesum, who was a student of Carl Jung, um, who uh, died in Auschwitz when she was 29, but she wrote in her war diaries, it was very much about finding joy in the saddest places. Um, and this quote, uh, her, her diary writings were found on the edge of the train tracks. She was in the same transit camp as my nan. And one, this quote which I got um, says, we may be sad and depressed by what has been done to us. That is only human and understandable, but we ourselves are our own worst enemy if we inflict the pain upon ourselves. I find life beautiful and I feel free. The sky within me is as wide as the stretching above my head. And she wrote that in Auschwitz when she knew that she was gonna die. She also, it was documented that she used to take the piss out of the SS guards being like, why are you in such a bad mood? Did your girlfriend dump you last night? And all this kind of shit, just like when things are that mad, you still like, like survival yeah. is through joy. Um, yeah. yeah. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, more than joy, I think about vitality. Mm -hmm. I think about, um, uh, like Dan said, uh, accessing the full expect spectrum of what is what means to be alive and um, for me and with the people with whom I work because I also develop an approach a, a pedagogical approach uh, based on on the workshops are based on HIV uh, on this kind of wisdom uh, I feel it's a kind of restoration of humanity bringing, uh, accepting that this is all part, the joy, the grief, the, the confusion, the complexity that virus brings us. So I feel for me, um, of course, like uh, having to go through my traumas and accepting my vulnerability, which is a uh, gerundio, uh, um, a process ongoing is an ongoing process because I also feel that uh, it's it's a recent path for me to come public and to be more in talks like the, like this and with other activists and I also feel it's um, sometimes a, a common place to go to this place of okay now I'm empowered and now I'm not going anymore to the place of confusion or rejection or and no now I'm just integrating that as part of life and. Uh, the process of going through self-prejudice or uh, facing your shadows and your lights with the society, lights and shadows, it's an ongoing process for life, you know. So I really feel it's accepting and including and embracing all that That's, it's to be human. Yeah, to... I think it's very much essential in that sense. And I remember always like how to, uh, talking about embracing contradiction and also embracing not this idea of a saint, uh, let's say. I was always thinking in the cancer uh, journals by uh, Audrey Lord at some point when she was saying like, suddenly because I went through cancer, I have to be this kind of, you know, like saint that I have to just like give example with my own life. Yes. I also want the bad Audrey Lord, you know, like uh, the one that was like constantly smoking, constantly drinking, and uh, <laughs> blaming uh, everybody. Like, why not in, yes. uh, in that sense? And within that, uh, I would like to continue precisely with, um, with a question that for us, I think it was very important with, uh, for Andrea and for myself, when we were putting together uh, not only this program, but also other projects that we have been done, that it is precisely when we were discussing uh, certain vulnerabilities and also the specialization of uh, pandemics, that uh, COVID-19 is not the first pandemic, it is not unprecedented, and it is not even the 
global pandemic, the only global pandemic that is actually uh, going on, uh, let's say, in different parts of the, of the world. And for us, it was very important from the very beginning, for example, to reclaim some of the histories, some of the stories that uh, uh, happen and are still, are still happening with HIV AIDS in, in that sense. You, you, you both uh, said it very well uh, in, 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 your bo in both your presentations. And one of the things was precisely this uh, redefinition of kinship, in a way. That is very usually kinship is defined through blood lineages, through this kind of idea of the traditional uh, heteronormative uh, definition of family. Mm -hmm. HIV AIDS uh, stated a form of uh, kinship. It was very much different, that it was shared, uh, that it was, what it was sharing was precisely their relationship to a non-human element, that it's HIV AIDS, that it is precisely a relationship that could be uh, taken in many different ways, but always through activism, always through caring, always through constructing other kind of ties, other kind of uh, belonging that uh, could transcend even humans to embrace also other non-human parts of our, own, of our own bodies. So I would like to ask you about uh, precisely this sense of kinship that uh, you could uh, consider in, in this sense of vulnerability as well. Mm. What comes to me, it's, uh, yes, we feel part of a vulnerable community because we feel uh, how much, especially, I can talk more about Portugal, uh, we are still marginalized. So I feel we um, connect a lot with other people, like to, to create a context that we can open the speech and we can unify and gather forces. I, I'm also feeling that as a transnational community. We felt that in the action that we developed with the uh, uh, viral, and I'm feeling that in Brazil. So for example, I have a, a LGBT trans woman that wants to come to Europe, and she's, she knows that she can, she can count on me to open contacts here. Uh, we can count on me, we can count on which, each other in vulnerable moments too, and I feel I feel it's this uh, this passage of not being in an individual struggle, but being knowing that we can count on in a collective is uh, surely I think it's it's recent. I feel you know because we are talking about a moment that the, the second silence for me was very heavy. I feel because it's a chronic disease right now. Oh, I don't need to talk about because nobody will know. I will not gen degenerate, so it's just for me to know. And so it's, it became it, uh, even more difficult to ask for help or to connect with your peers. And also another thing that, I don't know why, but I feel it's connected to what you are, s I feel that this kind of kinship, I don't feel it just between humans. Mm -hmm. I feel it, for me, recently, especially with the deepness that for me, uh, this other pandemic brought me, being already like with a big reflection and be dealing with complexity with the HIV pandemic. Uh, for me, COVID brought me, made me go deeper. And for me, virus in general, uh, for me recently, I see them as an invitation uh, to um, connect with nature. And I feel Nature as a nature in ourselves, uh, our essence, our vulnerabilities, our, our purpose, uh, wh who we are. Nature in relationships, so we, don't, we cannot forget this. Besides uh, virtual events and doing everything online, we cannot forget to hug, to see each other, to feel, to feel the intensity of our, our, our energy, right? And the nature, the big nature itself. So for me, viruses uh, have been an invitation for that. We can talk more about this in another moment. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. I need to, I need to move to um, Lisbon. Your nature is so much more beautiful than what we've got in, in London. Um, <laughs> um, so I'll come back. Um, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, one of my ACT UP mentors, we've got a kind of informal intergenerational 
mentoring program in ACT UP, which is vital, um, once said to me and really stuck in my head um, that 90% of the efficacy of transformation through activism isn't the fucking front page news about shit or chasing politicians or whatever. It's the everyday acts of support. Um, exactly. Having a cup of tea with your friend who's depressed, traumatized, yeah. going to someone's to the hospital clinic for the first time when they're getting their medication, they've never had anyone to go with before, helping someone with their housing application. Yeah. It's that, the 90% the 90 of the efficacy of revolutionary social change is relational. And that's the, the vulnerable kinship, which is never gonna get the front page of the press and we don't want it to. Um, but that really stuck with me. And just bringing, re relating to what you were saying about Audrey Lord and, and, and the current pandemic, one thing that really sticks with us um, in honor of Audrey Lord is that like none of us are free until we all are. And we know the COVID pandemic has very many similar parallels of who's getting hit first and worst. And the old spirit of self-care is an act of political resistance, of warfare, and that's what we need to do as, as well, hence coming back to the nature at some point. Yeah. So yeah, it's the relational aspect. I know that uh, it's already uh, late and uh, they have been uh, all this morning, but uh, still, I want to, to open the floor if you have uh, any questions, maybe we could have a question, and then uh, we can continue. We are going to be here all day long, and uh, there is going to be also like lunch, everything, so we can always have a coffee together, but still, I mean, uh, if you have a question. I think that actually, like, uh, having the questions or the conversations over a, a coffee Question or, or, or whatever. or something that you want to share. Exactly. It's, uh, we will have it. Uh, and, uh, but again, uh, two things. First, uh, of course, we will go uh, for lunch uh, now, and we will continue at 2.30 with, uh, with uh, one of uh, a very short uh, uh, film by Sofia Galliza Muriente, talking about other perspectives, other vulnerabilities also uh, from her experience also in Puerto Rico, and then a conversation with Sofia Galliza and Cruz Garcia on, on that. And then uh, we will close, of course, with, with with Polido. But uh, I just wanted to, to think again because if we are all here, we are all here also because of uh, people that uh, both Teresa and Dan had been sharing uh, and talking about uh, from ACT UP to many others that are really hugging us from different places and from different uh, books or from different mm. uh, conversations or from different callings and that we I think that we really feel them mm -hmm. and we should continue feel them and we should still have many different cup of teas mm. with them because I think that it is extremely extremely important so please join me to to, to thank again uh, Dan and Teresa for this uh, fantastic conversation okay.